Hello and welcome to Talks at Columbia. I'm Dr. Jason Wingard, Dean of the School of Professional Studies. We are here today for Talks at Columbia, a program that is based on thought leadership featuring Columbia faculty, scholar practitioners, and industry executives from all sectors. We are here today in Atlanta, Georgia at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, the site of Super Bowl 53, where the Los Angeles Rams and the New England Patriots will play here soon. We are joined today by Troy Vincent. Troy Vincent is Executive Vice President of Football Operations at the NFL. Troy began his career at the NFL 15 years ago with the Miami Dolphins, where he was the number seven pick overall in the first round. His illustrious career has allowed him in his current role as EVP to be well suited for leadership. He was a leader on the field. He was a leader as president of the Players Association and he's had progressively responsive leadership roles in the league office. Troy, thank you very much for joining us and welcome. What an introduction. Thanks for having me and welcome to the great city of Atlanta. Super Bowl 53 is upon us. Absolutely. I should also mention that Troy is also a member of our Board of Overseers at Columbia University School of Professional Studies. You are a very, very strong advocate and supporter of me providing advice and also our faculty and our administrators and students and alumni. So thank you for your service to Columbia University. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for allowing me to be part. Absolutely. So let's start off with player safety. So technology has advanced and improved. Medicine has become much more precise. And so what that has done is it's sort of changed the balance of player safety and the fan experience. The thrill of football, the hard hitting crunch is really exciting. Fans tune into it. They really love it. There's also concern now about what does that do to players and their health and their well-being? What do you all think about as leaders in the NFL? What do you think about as an EVP of football operations to both allow the players to be healthy playing this sport, but also to give the fans the wonderful experience that they're used to? Well, let me begin by the efforts made around player protection. Sure. It's a term that, that, that we use and just the advancement of medical technology, not just medicine, but when we look, we're able to make better, more informed decisions for the player, the coach, and ultimately the game itself, which makes it a better experience for the fan. The fan wants to see his or her stars play. But with the advancement in technology, with video review, injury mechanic, you know, being able to, to review injury mechanics, and then game rules, bringing all those together, allow us to make an informed decision to say, this is where the game is going, this is where it should go, but really we're better stewards of the game. Ultimately, the fan, the fan experience wins. Why? Because Andrew Luck is starting, he started week one, he ended in the playoffs. Patrick Mahomes started week one, Tom Brady, Jared Goff. Your stars we're seeing stay healthy and upright. So you played all the way through the NFL, the highest levels of football. I played Division I college football. I didn't quite get there, but I played. Your son plays Division I football. My son wants to play football. So what do you say to my wife, who doesn't want him to play, other parents who may have questions about the safety and the well-being of their sons and daughters on the field, what do you say to them to help to reassure that the game is safe, the game is fun, and it's something that we should all play and enjoy. Why wouldn't your child play, male or female? I So I have two boys that, that actually participate that are playing college football, that are student athletes, but the game itself, many you say, well, you can learn values in other sports, but the excitement of football, you know, what it brings to, to the community, you're talking about community engagement, community fandom, and as a parent, every parent should ask the question around player protection. So whether you're playing a contact sport that is football, hockey, lacrosse, are my coaches certified? Are the stewards of the game doing what they, are, they should be doing to protect my child? And as a parent sitting in the stands, you wanna make sure your son or daughter is being cared, cared for properly. Hydration education. So, Parents should have that question and ask the right questions, whether it's youth, high, high school, at the collegiate level, what are the caretakers doing to protect my child? Mm -hmm. So some of the rules that you all put in place to protect the players, 
Sometimes the players don't like those rules. Sometimes the fans don't like the rules. I didn't. I didn't like those. I didn't like some of them. You didn't like some of them. I didn't like some of them. And then sometimes trying to discuss some of those rules with my former teammates, former coaches, current coaches, current players. Jason, they're necessary. When you look at the data, we talked about medical and the advancement of medical technology and just as we as we learn, as we get the medical data, as we the engineering has advanced, it allows us to make more informed decisions on what? The quality of life for you as a participant later on in life. So we're just making better decisions for you. A young player doesn't know what he doesn't know. So you just have to explain that to him. What we're doing is so that you can have a better quality of life long term when you get done with the game. And what about the fans? So the fans will cry over social media and in the public about we need to make the game safer for those players. We need to protect them. But then when you make the rules that changes the game a bit, that provides their safety, then they say, well, wait a minute. Why aren't you letting the player hit the quarterback? Why are you changing the rules so that the smash mouth football is starting to dissipate? What do you say to those fans? I think the fan, it's, it's important that we communicate the why. Every fan has a, I give credit to the fan. When you explain the why we're doing what we do, and when they look at their stars from Tom Brady to Jared Goff to Brian Daw whomever it may be, the Tony Dorsett's, the Jim Browns, they want to make sure those heroes that they grew up watching, that they're in a good place long term in their lives. So we do believe it's important for us to educate the fan on the why the changes are necessary. Let's talk about domestic violence for a little bit. So over the course of your career and even now, you are a very, very highly regarded national outspoken um, advocate for domestic violence, for sexual harassment, gender discrimination child abuse. You've talked uh, and spoken very um, broadly about your own experience with domestic violence. So for players, for executives, for high profile individuals affiliated with the sports industry, you have a unique platform. People listen, people pay attention. What do you say about your responsibility or your colleagues' responsibility and how they need to follow you in speaking out about these social injustices? Well, my personal opinion is I believe we all share the responsibility of issues that plague our communities. When we talk about violence against women, young women and girls, that affects all of us, whether you're in the sports industry, non-sports, public sector, private sector. That's our responsibility, in particular as men, to stop these crimes. So from prevention work to education and intervention, we have to make sure that we're doing corporately and individually what it takes to stop violence against women. So I think we all play a role. And those that have more of a public eye, it's important that we get behind issues that plague our country. And the issue around violence against women, it goes on for centuries. When is it going to end? The facts don't lie. The numbers speak for themselves. We got to stop it. So I applaud your, your leadership in these efforts. Um, what do your colleagues say uh, about your platform, the way in which you use your platform as former NFL player, executive vice president of football operations, talking about um, and advocating for these issues? Do they want you to be quiet? Do they want you to focus on another cause or another issue? Or are they supportive? Or both? Not, not of all. It's a both and. They all, many understand my plight. I understand theirs is, I'm trying, I'm not, my position is not to get in front of my employer or my colleagues, but the National Football League, what we've done in this space from our learnings, understanding that issues around violence against women is complicated, working with law enforcement, working with families, working with organizations that support not just victims, uh, survivors, and also those perpetrators. It's a complicated issue. They, the office has embraced it. And was, we would say, we're part of the national dialogue. We don't have the answers. We feel like we're, we're doing our part of being part of the broader discussion on driving awareness around issues around violence against women. And there are other social issues that we also tackle. Crucial catch around cancer, uh, our social justice platform, 
So we do have a corporate responsibility that's broader than just domestic violence, sexual assault, issues around social justice. And these are, these are platforms that either are generated by senior leadership, players, coaches, that we all try to put our arms around and say, how do we make a difference? So for you as a leader, when you interact with the players and you talk about these issues of discrimination, harassment, um, uh, gender inequality, you know, domestic violence, what, how do they respond to you? Do they respond to you differently? You gotta walk the walk if you're talking the talk. No differently than you're on the field. It's hard to lead in the locker room if you're not producing on the field. And this is my 25th year in the area around domestic violence, sexual assault, but it doesn't matter what the issue is. It's, it's a matter about having a, a, a civil conversation, a respectful conversation and dialogue, whether it's around gender, whether it's around uh, race, doesn't matter the topic. Can we just sit down? Because once we sit down, we, we, we find out that we have more in common and we're actually wanting the same thing. It's how do we get there? And then explaining to one another our, our different experiences on how we see that particular issue. Right. So let's talk a little bit about my love, professional development. Every leader, as you know, I think needs to factor in professional development into their leadership structure and their vision. What do you say about professional development for this sport, for this league, for this industry? Is it about educating players so they can be better on the field? Is it about educating players so that they can be better off the field when they finish playing? Is it about preparing them to engage with fans or the media? Is it all of the above? It's all of the above. I like the term to both hand. Remember, we're still dealing with young men that are fresh out of college. They're 21, 22, 23, that are looking to be the best professional that they can be. That's on and off the field. So professional development is like a requirement, but it's a choice because you can just come and show up and play the game and work on your craft every day. And oftentimes we work on the things that people can see, catching, throwing, tackling. It's the other skills that really take us to the next level. Speaking, communication, writing, all of those are the professional development tools that you need to really take the athleticism that you have. You marry that with your professional skills and you just, you, you go to another stratosphere. So I've known you for a long time, and I was privileged to be able to watch your transition from the field to the front office. Uh, and you and did it's it, still transitioning. And, it's still <laughs> and I'm still transitioning. You're still transitioning. But you did it right. You did it the right way, in my opinion, because you benefited from professional development, because you asked questions, because you learned to listen and ask advice and, um, and plan your path accordingly. Tell us a little bit about what your transition was like, the pros, the cons, the highs, the lows of how you transitioned from being a player to being a leader of the league. And Jason, I'm still transitioning, and I try to share that with my colleagues, that transition is a lifetime. There's not one way to transition. Learn for life. Learn, yeah, you learn for life. That's right. And I'm a lifetime learner. So as leaders, one of the quality, a necessary quality is listening. And I've always prided myself on being a great listener. Don't have all of the answers. And, and, and really being intentional about what I wanna be, how I wanna be represented, and who I'm representing. So it's a choice. It goes back to making intentional choices on where am I gonna spend my time from a professional development standpoint? Am I willing to go back to school? Am I gonna take some time during the off season and enter into career development programs or take on leadership roles. Do things out of the ordinary rather than some of the things that are a requirement to stay on the field. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to when you were first starting your career. So you go back 20, 25 years to when you were- 92. 92, 92 when you were a young player. And you fast forward to now, and those same young players who are millennials have a different perspective, may have a different focus. How do you reconcile the difference between what you were thinking about and your peers in 1992 versus what the young players of today are focused on, are interested in, are using as the basis for how they approach their craft? Different world, different world from 92 when I was growing up in the mid 80s to what we see today 
when we look at the millennials, the most distracted generation in our time. So having a kid 30 and my youngest are 13, technology, when I was coming out of college, you had the cell phone that was part of your middle console. There was no such thing as carrying a, a cell phone around and we were just in the beeper age and now everything's in front of them. The options, they're so technological savvy. We as leaders have to embrace that. It's here, it's not going anywhere and it's cha changing on a daily basis. So that's the modern day athlete. There was no such thing as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that is, is here, it's not going anywhere. So the, when we're dealing with this generation as leaders, we have to embrace that. As I was told, either you will embrace it or you will become extinct as a leader because these young, the, the millennials will move on without you. Even in the hiring process, they want flexibility. They're not looking to be at a desk six or seven days a week. They want flexibility. You know, the, the technology, they want to be able to go out in the yard, still do their work with their, with their computer. Everything, you don't have an app for that? Can you send me that? You know, there's so, the, the <laughs> so millennials just So let's stay on that different. one for a second because I do a lot of executive coaching with CEOs. The number one question they ask me is how do I manage these millennials? I just can't connect to them. Whether you are a baby boomer or whether you're a generation X, these different generations are not able to connect with the millennials. It's not that hard, but some of what you're talking about are the keys to being able to do that. So what advice would you give to my next CEO client about managing millennials? You have to meet them where they are. What? And that means you, we being flexible. Our success came one way and we did it one way. That doesn't mean it's the only way. And we have to meet that young male or female exactly where they are. The if boss not, needs to be flexible. The boss has to be flexible, <laughs> must be flexible or we won't be running the company anymore. Or there's, you'd be looking for a new manager. And I think that, that applies in every industry because the kids are all the same. So you've been transitioning to your role as EVP. You're a lifelong learner, but you're doing a good job in managing football race operations for the NFL. Strategic planning is a big part of that. What are you thinking about right now? What's on the top of your mind here at Super Bowl 53 I know the game is going to be on very soon, but you're still thinking about the future, the future of the NFL, the future of football. Strategic planning wise, what's on the top of your list? So it's always with the top of the list. It's frankly managing tradition versus innovation. How do you maintain and preserve what the fans, the fan base has love, have come to love and learn at the same time adapting to technology with Coach to, coach to player communication, official to official communication. How is modern technology, how do we integrate that into, the, into our game where people still like seeing, did they get that last inch, did they get the first down? And not having technology disrupt the game. And always just thinking about minimizing risk. So here in Atlanta, you're thinking about minimizing risk. One, fan safety, making sure that the facility is ready for what is about to happen. Game day, technology, making sure both clubs, participating clubs have what they need. Making sure technology is working. So th those are things of just planning for game day. And then you're always thinking about where we are is we try to be risk adverse, controlling the controllables. So I know one of your priorities is diversifying the workforce, diversifying the staff who works for you and helping to diversify the coaching workforce as well and creating more opportunities for minorities. So let me ask you simply, does the Rooney Rule work? It has worked and it is working. Many people like to count numbers. Let's, let's start with this. Diversity is a fact. Inclusion is a choice. And that's so as a leader, think about that. Diver my experience, my diverse background, my color is not going to change. That's a fact. But including me in is a choice. And I think that's how we have, that's how we've been looking at it. We talk about the Rooney it's in, in, in its inception in 2002 and where we are today. The opportunity that it has presented, remember the Rooney is to, to present as best an equal playing field, a platform access, equal opportunity. 
we don't do the hiring, the clubs do the hiring. So we want to identify from a league standpoint, and under the leadership of Commissioner Goodell, we've been, how do we identify? How do we develop? How do we create a, as we would say, pipeline mm -hmm. um, on both sides of the ball? Then we also have to be careful of, this should not just be about men of color. That's the, that's the topic. If we talk about inclusion, we talk about how do we build and maintain good, strong, across the whole football community, gender, on field, finance, legal. We have to look at all of those disciplines inside the sport. Again, diversity is a fact, inclusion is a choice, and it starts with leadership. Well said. Viewership has been going down for the NFL. There's a lot of reasons for that. No, it's been going around, it's been going down across the industry, <laughs> not just the NFL. Okay, so let's share. Let's share the good <laughs> let's news. Let's share. All right. So across the industry of sports, viewership has been going down. As a leader of the NFL, you're particularly concerned with that in terms of your own strategic planning. So what are you thinking about? What are you doing, you and your colleagues, to prepare for continuing to uplift the NFL as a business when viewership is going down? How are you planning for that? So we, we, we talk about that frequently, you know, and it starts with, frankly, I always say that the competition on the field. And then how do we get the great game that's being played, how do we get that as many people as we can in many different channels as, as possible. The industry's changed. Cable TV has changed. Now you have streamings, fantasy football. So how do you get this great product? And it starts with a great product. I've been asked the question, why is viewership up this season? It starts with, it starts with the best players, the best coaches getting it on on Sunday. It starts with young great talent and then some of the greatest players that we've seen play our game and the drew Brees and tom brady get it on on sunday mondays or thursdays but we think about it all the time great product and then how do we get that product out as, into many different channels as possible so from a strategy standpoint as one of your objectives for enhancing viewership uh, is it true that you're thinking about expanding to the nfl the nfl to london well, international is a high priority, has been, been so under the commissioner's strategic plan. There's been talk about a franchise being abroad. We've seen other sports um, do it. We've played five international games a, a, a year. It is something that, that is discussed. And we've seen that the international market has embraced American football. So let's talk about Me Too, hashtag Me Too. There is a cultural movement now around the world where we are really focused on how can we eradicate sexual harassment, gender discrimination, and provide an environment where men and women are treated fairly and equally in the workplace. Cheerleading is a sport all the way from early childhood through high school to the college level. Young men and women are getting scholarships. There are obviously cheerleaders here in the NFL, across all franchises in the league. As leaders in the NFL league office, how can we support the sport of cheerleading and those who participate in it and allow that to allow ourselves to protect the sanctity of fairness and equality in the workplace? Well, from a league standpoint, we have to work with the clubs. League doesn't hire cheerleaders, the clubs do. It's like any other, it starts from the top. It's about creating a culture of inclusiveness. It's about the way we actually, no different than a player or the coach. What's the narrative? How do you market? How do you want your players and coaches to be perceived? It's no differently than cheerleaders, male or female. I think it starts at the top. I think it starts with leadership embracing that it is a sport and that these are men and women who go home just like we do that are lawyers, that are doctors, that are school teachers. And we have to make sure that we're presenting them in that, in that light. They just happen to, to cheer the, the arts of this is what they do in their pastime. But they're, they're just like any, any of us. I think it comes back to how we actually present from a league office. We make sure we work with the clubs. Not on, it's not about us teach, sharing with them about best practices, but making sure there are things in place um, policies and things that protect 
people, all people. So when I teach at Columbia University, one of the things I encourage my graduate students to develop is a personal board of directors, uh, a group of mentors, a group of advisors, a group of accountability partners who can help you along your path of lifelong learning. Do you have a personal board of directors? And if so, who's on it? So strategically, I'm going to take a page out of Coach Belichick's book. I'm not going, I can't give you my strategic plan because if I tell you who those <laughs> folks are, because they influence the way I think, how I see things, my board of directors. So I'm not going to give you my game plan, but I have a ton of accountability partners. And most of those are my colleagues internally, ton of legends. Most, most of my faith partners, those who walk with Christ, those that are married. I don't get advice from men that aren't married. I'm married with five children, so a single man get, can, gives me very little advice in, as it pertains to where I should be going and as it pertains to relationships. But I would strongly recommend everyone needs it. Everyone needs someone that counsel, as they say, confidant, um, Conrad, um, but that board of advisors, I do have a board of, of, we would say, overseers. But I, if I give them up, you'll say, oh, so that's, is, that's who's influencing that's his, that's, that's his strategy. That's where he's getting that from. I don't want to put a bullseye on those people's back. Okay, so I'll let you off the hook with not revealing your personal board of directors. I know Coach Belichick is looking over your shoulder, so we'll, we'll let you off the hook on that one. But I will ask you the question, who do you put on a pedestal in the form of a leader uh, who you would like to emulate, who you reveal. Can you give us insight into the type of leader and the characteristics they embody that you like to follow? It's simple. My Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay. No man. My walk with Christ gives me the example of what I can be, what I was called to be. And I don't get the highs and lows of emotions, of counsel. My Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ and his principles is the best example of what I can be. For the Columbia graduate students who are watching this, what advice would you give them about graduating from Columbia University, a distinguished Ivy League institution, transitioning into the world of work, either accelerating in their existing career or taking on a new one or pivoting? Based on all you've said about leadership, the strategic planning that you follow, the leadership characteristics that you embody, the advice and counsel that you get from others in your network, the social responsibility that you hold. What advice would you give to my Columbia students about how to win in the world of work? Well, I would say Columbia embraces all those things. Leadership, tremendous thought leaders. I would ask the students from Columbia to share, to continue sharing the leadership that you've developed, the principles, the values that you've developed while on campus, because it's a unique, very uh, special place for special people. When you share what you've learned on campus, we're a better, we're a better community, we're a better world. So once again, we are here at the site of Super Bowl 53. I've been joined today by Troy Vincent, Executive Vice President of Football Operations. We've been talking about leadership in the sports industry. Troy is a true leader. Troy is a true advocate of social justice. Troy is the embodiment of thought leadership and sharing, and you are certainly a lifelong learner. Troy, thank you very much for Thanks being Thanks for with having me. me. Appreciate it. Enjoy.